gang. Here's to nights that turn into mornings and friends that turn into family. Cheers! Hello, hello, and welcome to the Friendship IRL podcast. I'm your host, Alex Alexander. My friends, they would tell you, I like to ask the hard questions. You know who I am in the group. I'm the person that's saying, okay, I'm going to ask this question, but don't feel like you have to answer it. And now I can be that friend for you too. I was at my Toastmasters meeting the other night, and there was a new person there, a guest, who didn't know me very well. But during the meeting, I had mentioned this podcast and the work I do, and this guy came up to me and he said, so you talk about friendship. I said, yes, and I talk about community and societal messages and breaking down the norms. I talk about the various societal structures that are in place that are making this harder. He said, wow, okay. And I said, here's the deal. I don't think I can tell you to just go out there and make friends without acknowledging that, yeah, we have created a world in which that's a little harder, where not only are you having to like move through your own internal resistance, but you're really having to like put in work to go find places to meet those friends. And that is difficult. That is energy. That is work. And so I hope that there's always this mix of why it's worth it, how we do it. And oh, by the way, yeah, that does feel a little harder than it should feel. But again, it is worth it to do it. Today's episode is an episode where we talk about how we really, and by we, I mean kind of this adult generation, most people don't feel like they were taught the skills to be intentional about friendship and community in their lives, how to make and maintain these connections. And a lot of you come to me and you say, how do I not pass this on? As in, like, how do my kids not have to deal with this? And my thought process on that, like the thing I keep coming back to is we all start making small changes. We all start deciding this is a priority. We stop acting in the same old ways. We rewrite our own rules of friendship and decide that even though it's not the norm to be this intentional, we're going to do it anyways. Although it's not the norm to like stop and say hi to people in our neighborhood, we're going to do it anyways because we don't want to continue this cycle. This cycle is not working. So we are going to act differently in it. Now, in order to do that, I would say that this entire episode is a mix of we need to be intentional. Here are some small examples of how we might do that. And then some acknowledgement of why that feels hard, like those systemic things that are happening. And then another example, another like avenue of Here's how we might start changing our patterns. And then some acknowledgement of why that's hard. And we kind of go through this cycle a few times. And I think that episodes like the one today are super important so that you know that when you feel that little bit of resistance, that isn't just you. We're all feeling that way. But the only way we're going to make any changes is if we acknowledge it and we push through. Let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. Today's guest is Anne-Marie Beattie. And Anne-Marie reached out to me because, I mean, one, she's just super interested in this topic. But two, we kind of started off talking about her experience as a leader in her local homeschool community. And that notion that kids that are homeschooled aren't getting enough socialization and how Her experience is really the exact opposite because you have to be so intentional about socialization that once you realize that, you actually, again, like start rewriting your own rules. Amory is, as I mentioned, 
a mom. She's a therapeutic life coach. She has studied child psychology and child services. She is super involved in leading her local homeschool community. And this was really just, I mean, it was a conversation. This wasn't me asking a bunch of questions. You're going to hear me in this episode have some aha moments and connect some things together. Stick with it. Like, I'm not going to lie. It's a lot coming at you in this episode, but stick with it. I think it's a really powerful episode. I think it connects a lot of dots together and might make you realize that the times that you've tried to do something and it feels too hard, that's not just you. So with that, let's get to today's episode. Hi, I'm Marie. Oh, I can hear the birds chirping in the background. Good morning. (laughs) How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to do this episode with you, to chat with you about how we're making friends and how friendship is a skill set that we're not really taught because the more I talk to people, the more I hear from them that they, most people don't think of friendship as a skill set or habit. Mm. They just think of it as this thing that happens in their life without much thought of how they've made the friends that they have. It's true. We have this sense of, you know, going through our lives and we, we have people come and go. And if you're the type of person that is okay with talking to people or maybe you've had family that have just had lots of people around, you've never had to have that self-reflection and go, oh, how did I make those friends? Or what can I do to make friends? And yet there's people out there that are on their own and they've they may not have friends or or they may at a stage in their life because something has happened that their friendship group has gone or they've moved away and then it's, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm lonely. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, you're recording from Australia. I haven't looked up the stats in Australia, but the U.S. Surgeon General just released. So loneliness has been declared an epidemic in the U.S. Mm -hmm. It was officially declared in 2018, and they just kind of re-declared it, like reminded everyone, hey, this is still bad and actually getting worse. And we're now at the point where they say that one in two adults, so over half of all adults, are commonly experiencing extreme loneliness. That blows my mind. Isn't that staggering? That's sad. Mm, It is sad. And upsetting. So I haven't looked up Australia's stats, Mm. but I do know that this is an issue Mm. that is worldwide, some cultures less than others, but definitely prevalent here in the US. But we're a generation of the connected. We're all connected Mm -hmm. and yet very lonely. Wow. Wow. I'm not surprised. I would say it's possibly similar here. I wouldn't, I haven't looked at any stats in that regard. I will definitely after this. Wow, is what I can say. Yeah. And I think so much of it is this idea that we have never really thought about how we make our friends, what we are intentionally and actively doing to cultivate. I mean, I say friends, but also our community and just like relationships that feel fulfilling in general. And we aren't really taught that that's something we can impact and build for ourselves. So I was so excited when you reached out because you have kind of a unique perspective being a part of the homeschooling community. A lot of people learn to make friends. I shouldn't have put that in air quotes, but like they learn to make friends through proximity as kids by playing outside with their neighbors, by maybe the church or mosque or synagogue that they go to having a children's group that they attend every week. And for a lot of kids by going to school. And so if you don't go to school, 
every day, then I think a lot of people assume Mm -hmm. that you're not getting the same socialization, but you're saying what when we talked before and what we're going to talk about today is that it's actually maybe a more empowering experience because you are having to learn the skills and the habits and you can't just rely on day-to-day proximity of seeing the same people five days a week, nine months a year. Correct. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about maybe your experience with this, your take? Mm. So there's often stereotypes. One of the most amazing ones that keep coming up is, but how will your kids socialize as a homeschooler? And often I will have this conversation when I'm out within society talking to people and then these people go, but how would your kids socialize? And I will then look at my children and go, they are. You've just had a conversation with them. They're over there borrowing the books. The librarian has taken them over to that section because they've both got very similar tastes and they're exchanging ideas and their best and favorite characters. I said, they are actually socializing right now. But in saying that, that is something that my children learnt from me because I would be taking them out and I would talk to people and I intentionally created community. Not everyone has a skill to do that. I realise it's a gift that I have and this is on that reflection is going, how do I make friends? Because now my children are that bit older. They're a little bit more discerning. So two of them are teenagers. And we also went through lockdown for two years of being physically distancing from people. So that sort of threw in a spanner that created a, it was an interruption to their ability to socialize and and keep nurturing their friendships because not everyone had the same access to technology as each Mm, other. So that's one thing that comes up is that stereotype. But I also know families that are homeschool and they don't go out as often and the children can feel lonely. But they also socialize within their own family unit. When we do see them, the children know how to have a conversation with all ages. And that I find unique because when you see a group of, say, school kids in there, it might be five to ten of them, and you engage, you try to engage them in conversation, they're almost speaking a different language or they're not willing to communicate because I'm an adult and they're children or teens. And that got me thinking, is the socialising in school as good as we believe it is? Mm-hmm. Or is it that proximity? Is that we're put into a classroom of, say, 20 other students of a very similar age? And probably socioeconomic status, mm-hmm. beliefs. Like it's a very comfortable, quite often, definitely not for everybody. There are definitely people that are in classes where they do not feel like they belong there as well. But this is all to say it's normally not very mixed no. in whatever. Way. No, it's quite contrived in many ways. Yes. And if you don't necessarily click initially or gel or make that instant connection, you have to create allies. And so the friendships at school may not be the friendships that we truly mm-hmm. would seek out if we actually had the opportunity. A unique perspective for myself is when there's families that remove their children from the school system due to any number of reasons and decide to home educate or homeschool and they come to our social outings or our excursions, it's interesting to see how the children interact with the other children. Mm -hmm. And if the parent is not forthcoming, outgoing, trying to make connections, some of these children just don't know how to engage. And it's because we're a group of families doing our own thing 
how children had been allowed to make their authentic connections within this group. We're not a school. We don't go, okay, here's a new family, you know, we must all stand up and welcome such and such, you know, we buddy them up and we don't do that. It's actually up to the new family to make the effort and the connections. That is very daunting for some people. Some adults don't know how to show their children how to do this. There are so many layers Mm. to this that are just like running through my mind. And the first one is, you know, what you were saying about the proximity, maybe almost like limiting, right? So when kids are born, kids don't really have much control over their socialization. And they're learning. And we don't see this necessarily as a society as something that we really need to teach, right? You just go to school or you see people do this. But kids are quite often watching their parents. So if their parents aren't modeling this, if it's not discussed as a priority in their home, then we're just sending kids off to, let's say they're going to school. And then that kid doesn't really have any control, right? The parent has picked where they live. They've picked the community groups they're a part of. They, I mean, even can say yes or no to a get together with another family, right? They, the parents are the gatekeepers to your friends, to your connections, to your socialization. And so many people make great friendships in that. Mm-hmm time period of their life but they didn't really have any control and then somehow society has told us when we become adults that this is harder and it's rare and all these things but if you think about it we have more control and possibility and influence over the friendships we make as adults than we ever did as kids and somehow we've been disempowered in that we've been told that It'll never be as good when in reality, as adults, we can put ourselves in places with people that share our interests or our beliefs or don't share our beliefs so we can broaden our understanding of the world. Like we can create more aligned relationships than we ever could as kids. You know, there's the other layers of the whole modeling piece. When this idea of like the proximity friend is really championed in society and you weren't really taught the habits or skills to build relationships. And when I always say that, I mean like to go places and meet new people, to get over the discomfort and to move through it, to be intentional about reaching out, having conversations, finding things that you enjoy doing together to stay in contact, to manage your differences and move through conflict. Like none of these are really acknowledged as skills, but they are all required to build these relationships without proximity. Yes. So now you have a bunch of parents who are parents in this homeschool community who are standing in this room and can't model for their kids because they don't even know what they're doing. That is true. It's fascinating to see. My local community, I've been friends with families that made the decision very early, even pre-kids, that they were going to home educate. And I was also one of these families that at the very beginning, after my children were born, I chose home education. And I did lots of research on how, and so for me, it was very important to have a community around me. So I worked very hard, very early on to create a community and we are still friends with these families. Now these families would never have really been on my radar ever. Like there's a big age difference in the adults because I'm an older parent and the interest and faith and everything is all different and separate. But what we had in common was the idea of creating community acceptance for our children. And 
that has just happened. And there are other families that will come and go because it's a large community locally. But what I've found is people rely, parents rely quite heavily on go to school, make friends. And that's not always the case. And then often the families that Mm -hmm. then have to remove their children from school because they're that square peg going into a round hole and it's just not suitable and school is not suitable for so many, that then they're like, oh, you mean I, as the adult, have to make an effort to have my children make friends? It's like, yes, Mm -hmm. we as a community would like to know, you know, what's your intentions, like, you know, a little bit about yourself and what are your kids' interests. And that's hard for some families or some adults because they may have just, you know, go to work, you know, get their kids ready for school, maybe take them to one sporting event. And they actually don't necessarily have anybody outside that little bubble. They might have themselves just know a few members of the sporting club and they may have devotions on the weekend where they go and worship and they'll have that connection. But that's it. They don't know how to communicate or connect for their children's sake. And I then feel quite validated in saying that homeschoolers actually know how to socialize versus you were raised and you were in that school situation. So that power had been taken away so early when we learn so much. Our children are absorbing everything. It's that, you know, they're doing as you're doing, not as you're saying, because they are just constantly modeling and then they are put into a school situation and they are then modeling one adult in a classroom of kids their same age. So they're not necessarily learning a healthy way to connect because the teacher is the authority and they're not. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that kind of touches back on what you were saying about kids not necessarily learning how to socialize with adults or grandparent age, older people, that there is a piece of this that is so focused on kids socializing with other kids, but that it's just as important to be able to socialize amongst various ages. And so if you're in this room and the pressure is really on socializing with other kids all the time, Mm. and we don't really see the socialization with a neighbor who's older or the couple down the street that doesn't have kids but enjoys chatting to your kid while they walk around your garden as part of socializing we're missing out on this huge opportunity that leads back to the loneliness thing why are there so many lonely people I knew a local doctor and she had said to me, oh, I know so many elders that are missing their grandchildren because their kids had moved away across the other side of the country or or another, you know, other side of the world. And that means there'd be grandkids that are missing their grandparents. You know, maybe we could set up a club and like hire a grandparent. And I just thought, what a wonderful opportunity. Truly, what a wonderful Mm. opportunity. Well, when we had chatted last time, you mentioned the, we call them, well, we have preschools. Mm -hmm. Like preschools, you call them in age Mm -hmm. care facilities in the States, we'd call that like maybe a nursing home or elder care facility. And as soon as you said that, I said, oh my gosh, that's genius. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like these are two populations of people who need care. And they are populations of people with endless amounts of time. And what do you normally fill time with? Like interaction or learning, connection. So if we bring them together, like they have time to interact with each other. Like at the root of it, not even to mention people that might be grandparents missing their grandkids or kids that wish they had a grandparent figure. Like in the end, it's just more positive adult role models and kids that bring a little joy to a population of people that are often forgotten. 
Why not? It's so genius. It is genius. They're trying to roll it out and have the the childcare, early kindergarten, preschool held once a week in mm-hmm. the local retired person's home, nursing home, and the joy on those people's faces and the older adults sitting there fully engaged with a, a young child and as busy parents, as busy adults working, we often don't have the time to listen to the babbling children. Mm-hmm. But the older generation realised that this is so invaluable. There was an entire television program series, I think they're doing another one here in Australia on this, and it you have to have tissues because it's so heartwarming to see the relationships between these children and our older citizens and the life that comes back into our older people that are in these homes with other older people because they may not be as mobile. They don't have the opportunity. They may not have the finances to have a personal carer take them out or their family is too busy or not available. So it just makes sense to me that we are isolated into ages artificially too soon. Like if you're a parent that is working and you have mortgages to pay and and you have a baby and then at six weeks you put them into childcare because you have to and they're in the infant room. And then when they get to a certain age, they're Mm. in the two-year-old room. And then after that, it's the three, four-year-old room. And then it's almost off to school. And there's, it's all screams at me as artificial and leading us to not be in control of how we connect as a community. Yeah. And I mean, we're obviously talking about, this is like a structural systemic thing, right? We, We can hope that maybe the Australian government. I mentioned this to a friend and she said that that they're maybe piloting in California and we could hope for the government to implement this or for facilities to open or whatnot. But you're so right. If this sounds, if somebody's listening to this episode and is thinking, this sounds great, why don't we have this? You probably have neighbors who would love interaction with your family and with the little kids in it. Mm-hmm. That's where I talk about like this being a skill and an intention. Like you can choose that for your family. You can say, I would love to find that. And then you can keep your eyes open when you're walking through your neighborhood and maybe start chatting with someone, maybe invite them over for dinner or even just a quick chat. Make sure you stop by and say hi, like start intentionally trying to cultivate that relationship for you, but maybe also for your family in general. Like we don't have to wait. It'd be lovely if the governments thought that this was a priority and created these systems, but we can create this in our life. And if 10,000 people listen to this podcast episode and did just that, think of the ripple effect it could start to have. Life-changing for some, definitely. I truly could actually make a dent in the statistics on loneliness because a lot of our elder population is very, very lonely. Very lonely. And they have so much knowledge, so much information. And have you heard the term living books where an elder will sit there and tell a story? And it's not even just older people. It, it's been run locally in some of the libraries where you can go to the library and there will be a variety of people sitting at a table and there's a couple of chairs and you can go up and they will tell you stories, their stories. And that would not be difficult to, you know, if implement. If you're a member of a local library or a small community and you're thinking, oh, these are great ideas – approach the local library and say, hey, have you heard of this? Is this something we could do? Yeah. During lockdown, when we were not allowed to move more than X amount of miles or kilometres, the weather 
was autumn here when it all started and we would sit outside the front and there was chalk drawings. I'm not sure if that was a thing in the States, but mm. there was people going around and walking. So, you know, we'd actually draw pictures on the sidewalk so people would see these pictures and, you know, people take a photo and they'd go up on social media. But I saw the neighbours come out and I'm like, I didn't realise you had children. And the communication, even though we weren't allowed to be physically close, we could at least sort of shout across the road. It was like we stopped being busy doing other stuff because we couldn't go anywhere and we're at home and home then became our safe place and then there was people around that you may never have seen. Like you literally see the car drive out, drive down and then they'll come back in the evening and that's it. And it led me to a story my cousin had told me. She lives on a corner block and she needed the fence redone and so the fence was pulled down and her children quite little and so she'd be out on her lawn playing and people would be walking and it's very difficult to walk a corner and not engage especially when there's children going hello and she now has this amazing community in her block and area because she didn't have a fence for six months and had no choice but to interact with these people and people didn't have a choice but to interact. And that is like we've got these fences around our homes and our yards and, Mm -hmm. you know, anybody wanting to talk to my children must be a threat or there's so much fear or we don't have the skill set. We don't realize that we can actually engage in conversation. We don't have to sell our souls just to talk to someone. We can communicate and trust that we will get an inkling of whether they're the type of people we'd like to have another conversation with and then another and then maybe a cup of tea. This isn't the first time I have said what I'm about to say, which is making And maintaining friendships in today's day and age is harder. Part of that are structural reasons, as well as just cultural shifts that have happened over the past few decades. And I think that's really important to acknowledge because if you are ashamed of your friendship situation, if you are frustrated, if you feel like you're putting yourself out there, if you just don't understand why everyone else seems to have it together and you don't, first of all, I hope you've listened to this podcast and you realize you're probably not alone. A lot of people are wishing their social situation was different. But also, it really truly is more difficult because of societal sized choices and issues. So as I listen to this part with Anne-Marie and we're talking about, you know, the backyards and being separated, I just want to point out a couple of other episodes you should go listen to. Because again, this is like we're pulling on strings here. We're touching on things, but there are deeper levels you might be interested in listening to. So I would suggest going and listening to episode 38 and 39. They are both about third places. Episode 38 is an episode that I did solo, kind of talking about what is a third place. Episode 39 is with a guest, Nathan Albach, and it was truly an amazing episode. He is so knowledgeable about third places. I mean, I gave him a nearly impossible task when I said, can you please talk about the demise of third places from a structural perspective, which is a lot. It's a lot. And he did a fantastic job giving us what feels like drinking from a fire hose, but it's really kind of an overview because of course we could go deeper. So I would listen to both of those. If you're listening to like, yeah, we all have fences and you're nodding your head, go listen to those episodes. The other episode I would suggest is episode 41, which is about this concept called the liking gap. The liking gap, to give you a very brief idea of what it is, the liking gap is if you go and you meet somebody 
on the street. I mean, really anybody. We're going to say you meet somebody in your local coffee shop and you chat it up for a couple minutes and you walk away. We all assume that the other person did not enjoy the interaction, right? You bothered them. You were weird. It was an awkward conversation. But studies show that if we gave that person an exit poll when they walked away from the coffee shop, they enjoyed it. Our brains are tricking us. And the reason that's important here is because so many of us are walking through our days either assuming that nobody around us wants to talk, hence staying in our houses and being in the backyard and things like that. There is another piece I just want to acknowledge here, which is the decline in social trust. Now, this is something I should do an entire episode on. I am not going to cover it in this little pop-in. But basically, social trust is this kind of generalized trust we move through the world with, where we have the sense of trust to a relatively large circle of unfamiliar people, as in maybe people in your community, versus particularized trust, which is you trusting like some specific people you have a pretty developed relationship with. Some other terms for this are thick and thin trust, which I think I like better because they're just easier to use in a conversation. But for this little aside, I went and pulled some facts. Like I saved so many articles and books and things, and I pulled a couple things off my shelf. I spent about 20 minutes over here kind of digging in to pop in for this aside because I want to get it right. The general social survey, which was conducted in 2020, early 2020, documents that social trust has dramatically declined in the U.S. In the early 1970s, half of the people surveyed said that they trust most people as they move through their day. Half. But in 2020, that figure was down to nearly one third. So 33% of people out there are walking through their days with trust. And the reason that's important to acknowledge and I should do a bigger episode is because if you don't have social trust, why would you be hanging out in your front yard or walking down the street or striking up a conversation with these people? It's an extra barrier we have to get past. And I want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge all three of those because We are doing this episode and I want to bring light to these issues, but simultaneously, if you feel like it's hard, there are stats that back that up. Yeah, there's, there's two things here that come to mind. One is that, right, quite often the first barrier connection is we all assume that the other people don't want to talk to us, that they probably already have friends or that they're busy or that they're whatever. And I mean, we already covered the fact that one in two people are (laughs) extremely lonely. So you got a 50% shot. Also, there are endless studies that show that although we assume nobody wants to talk to us, people actually find so much enjoyment once it starts on both sides. So that holds people back from, let's say, walking through their neighborhood in a time when there isn't a shared experience. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's a piece of it that happened with the pandemic is the likelihood that somebody was feeling lonely Mm -hmm. in lockdown was 95%. Mm -hmm. And so it lowered that barrier. We were more likely to say hi because we figured they would like it too. And so we would do it. So that's one thing. And then, you know, you're bringing up the front yard. I think about this all the time too, right? Everybody wants a really big backyard. They want a backyard with a fence. It's the only place you hang out. If people just sat on their front porch sometimes, you would probably meet so many more of your neighbors. So many more. And then the other thing you were talking about is it's called weak ties. So basically there's strong ties where we actually have like a robust relationship with someone. We know who they are. We know details about them. And we have quite a bit of trust in our strong ties. Then there's weak tie relationships, which are basically the people that we see out in the world that we don't really know. And 
there's a fantastic book called Bowling Alone that basically details, like tries to get to the root of why our weak ties have deteriorated, why we don't trust Mm. other people. And there's a variety of factors. But the problem is, it's like the never-ending pattern, the never-ending cycle, right? Because we assume that no one wants to talk to us or that we maybe can't trust them. So we don't talk to them, which then weakens our weak ties more (laughs) versus putting ourselves out there. Like if we talk to more people and appreciated more simple relationships and the community in general, we would be more likely to invest our energy and trust it. But we don't. We shut ourselves off and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse, which is why I talk so much about appreciating the simple relationships in our life. There's actually like a root cause of or root reason I do that. Because if people can start seeing the people around them as valuable, they're more likely to invest in them and trust in them. Wow. We're just like stuck in this never ending pattern that people don't even know exists or is happening because we don't talk about it enough. And it's only making it worse. So if it's this bad now, without paying attention to it, what is it going to be like in 10 years? That's scary. It's heartbreaking to think about. Like I love talking about this community and friendship stuff. And I want people to find this for their own lives. My hope is that if you can find it in your own life, you will inspire other people to do that. If enough people do that, we could actually reverse some of the situation that we're in. My mind went to a number of things then. And those small connections, those understanding the micro moments in time can make such a difference. A smile to someone, an acknowledgement, I see you, can go such a long way. And the trust and knowing what trust is, is it because we weren't trusted as children to be able to make decisions for ourselves? So it's, you know, so there's all of these thoughts that popped into my mind and I'll always come from that perspective of the home educator, but also with my therapeutic life coaching sort of spin on things going, how do people trust themselves if they weren't trusted as a child or as a student as a team member and can we reverse all of this well yes I think we can I think we can just be open and curious about the people Mm -hmm. the humans around us people walking dogs what a wonderful way to meet people like Can Mm -hmm. I pat your dog? And then you can have a conversation with your dog or people walking their cats or they might have a pet bird. That is a simple way to do it. But that walking around the neighbourhood with the intention of if I see someone, I'm going to say hello this time. Mm -hmm. And being okay with they might not want to say hello back because they might have had a busy day. But if you were to do that twice a week, for a month, they're eventually going to respond. You know, it's not stalking or anything, but like if you're going for your your daily walk or, you know, your exercise and you aim it for that time because that's when they're arriving home from work or, you know, or you see them driving past in the car, it's a hello, it's a hello. Or is there something local that is already running like the men's shed or the women's shed where, Mm -hmm. you know, people that are retired get together and learn new skills. Again, you know, can you find out whether you can join and maybe introduce your children or I'm scared that it will keep going this way, but I don't want it to. I want us to, biologically, we need a tribe, a village, a, a group around us that just how we thrive. Yeah, we're not meant to do this alone. Survival is in community, Mm. yes. We can't self-care our way out of this, which is what we're told. It's like, do it alone and do all these things. You know, you ask like why we've gotten here. This is a big question. There are lots of books written about it. But some very tangible things are, if you think about it, 
I brought up this concept and I'm going to do a whole episode on it, but there's something called third places, which is basically a place you go that is not home and is not work or school, but a place you go where you will consistently see people that you don't have to schedule, you don't have to make an appointment. You just go and assume that people will be there who want to connect. And it's kind of a place that like people go repetitively. So this can be a place of worship. It could be a, what you're saying, like a men's shed, women's shed. Bowling alleys used to be this. It's like a place that you go to see people. These have disappeared for a variety of reasons. I'm going to do an episode on it. But what that means is that social media, the internet, has become our third place. And if we know anything about the internet and social media, it's that because you don't actually have to see people in person, you don't actually have to connect with them. And we can filter, we can choose, we can curate what we put on the internet we now have these beliefs about these other people that we can't have conversations with, really, and that we have no idea what the full story is behind that, that we make up all these stories. And it's like the stories and assumptions that get in the way that erode those weak ties. Mm. So we aren't really connecting. We aren't hearing people's stories. We don't know much about them. And the more and more that happens, why would you say hello to your neighbor? Like you've probably created a story about them. We're very used to doing this now. You know, you're convinced that everyone might, that the hello that they say to you could have ill intention behind it because we've just bought in because we don't even know anymore. We don't really seek out to talk to the people around us. We just shut down, assume, and keep going to our next thing. I have made this kind of, I don't know, cheeky statement, slogan, tagline. I've like, I've used this before, not necessarily in tons of my marketing materials, but I have said this to people. And that is when people are like, what are you doing here? What is your work? I will say, I am rewriting the rules of friendship. And it's meant to be kind of like, haha, funny, but I'm listening to this episode and I'm thinking to myself, like, that's really what this is. Like, maybe that is really what I'm helping everybody do here. That's not to say I am culturally rewriting the rules of friendship, but what I am asking is for each of us to individually rewrite our own rules of friendship. So I mentioned earlier, right, that this is a little harder because of the societal situation we are in, because of the norms when it comes to connection. And that's what this is. This is like deciding, I don't want to keep doing these same things that have left me lonely or feeling disconnected. I, myself, want to rewrite my own rules of friendship and I want to act differently. So for example, I want to not be part of this statistic when it comes to social trust. And the way to combat that, I mean, this is according to like research, go back and listen to that liking gap episode. But the way to do that is to talk to people. When we just see people as random faces walking through the crowd, we can make up all these stories in our head about them. When we stop and talk to someone, we learn that they have their own problems and thoughts and interests, and it humanizes these people. And when we humanize people, we are more likely to trust them. Again, science research for this in the Liking Gap episode. So that's me rewriting my rule and saying, I am going to have more of those like simple little conversations. I'm going to change the statistic. I mean, could be anything. I'm going to not spend so much time on social media involved in parasocial relationships, which is the norm for a lot of people right now. There are so many ways, but at the end of the day, I think if you are somebody who is listening to this podcast, you have some feelings that you wish your social situation was different. And I really firmly believe that this is a one person at a time changing things and that will inspire somebody else. 
And that is what is going to make the greatest impact. So I hope that inspires you to maybe rewrite some of your own friendship rules. That is so true. The story making up in the mind. And I call my children out on it quite a bit. Oh, such and such said this, so they meant all of this. And I'm like, did they say all of that? Mm -hmm. Or are you just making that up? Are you telling yourself a story? Oh, I'm telling myself a story. Okay, as long as you know it's a story and that you have no idea what their intentions are. And I will pick myself up and I'll start having a conversation with my husband and then I go, look, this is all the story. None of this is fact. This is just what I think. (laughs) And being okay with doing that but knowing you're doing that. So if people that are listening can go, I might do that too. Okay, because they drive that car or they rev it really loud in the morning, they must be that type of person. Maybe go and find out if they're that type of person. Yes, so that stops so much. And the social media, the anti-social media (laughs) and that contrived images. When you were saying that, I was thinking those filters on the cameras and the selfies and stuff. It's like, you know, I sometimes look at some of my school peers and go, wow, they look amazing. They use filters, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I'm not a spring chicken and, you know, I've got, I earned these laughter lines. These are mine from the tears <laughs> and the laughter. <laughs> like they're mine. I own these. People should see them. It's uncomfortable though to expose yourself as this person. Mm-hmm. And but your perception of yourself of what what you think people think of you is probably not accurate. And no, actually, I was told once that like other the people's opinions of you is none of your business. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So if uh, my intentions are too, yeah. good and I want to do good and help and live my world and do what I need to do to contribute, then that's fine. If people want to judge me on that and do that that's their story to tell about me if they want to know about me they can ask me or I will tend to talk I will talk to most people so don't stand too still because I'll probably come up and talk to you not everybody's comfortable in doing that and not everybody is comfortable to having someone come up and speak to you so having an awareness of safety and knowledge is another skill set that some people just don't have And so if they don't like talking to people, they just go, I'm an introvert. I don't like people. And it's like you might not (laughs) Mm -hmm. like lots of people, but there will be definite people that you love within your little network or you might be isolating yourself and creating that loneliness because you bought into the idea of some personality test you may have done and therefore I'm an introvert and I don't talk to people or I don't like them or insert whatever story you know and I think in like trying to look at the common thread in this episode because I I will find one I mean I already kind of think I know what it is but when I go back and re-listen to them it's always wild what appears to me out of these episodes and I think this one is kind of this idea that somehow we've been convinced that we are learning these skills through proximity and school But I think what we're finding out is we very much are not. And adults as well are not, have not learned. And it's something that we need to invest some thought and energy into because we can change it. We can make a difference. We can do things differently and set a different example. But the path that we're currently on is not working for most people. No, no. And like any skill we learn or any habit, this is where I'll go with that micro moments of self-care, of curiosity. You can create a new habit that you can make a difference in your own life, which will then snowball and make a difference in somebody else's life. and. Be willing to know that we can learn new skills anytime and we are hardwired for learning as humans. 
we may be told that you have to go to a certain place to learn. You might be a product of that place to go and learn. It ties in with the home, well, I call it life yeah. education with my children. It's very much naturally led by them. They're learning what they need when they need it in the way they need it. And I am offering them opportunities to constantly learn and improve. And it's a lot of discussion about things. It's not a, here, you need to learn this now and I'm telling you to learn it and then I'm going to test you on it, which is often the framework for schools. And so my kids are constantly curious and learning and and wanting to and they're not fearful of learning something new or being a little bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And is that it? Is it comfort? Like is the proximity thing that comforts? Mm -hmm. Coming back to that, like, oh, well, I'm in here and this is, well, these are my family friends, this is my church friends, this is whatever. And then all of a sudden you've got this amazing promotion and you have to move cities and you're like, uh, well, I can make work friends, but you don't actually gel with most of them because maybe you're now the boss and, you know, you may not be allowed to be friends with the people that work for you, then what do you do? How do you go about making that connection with somebody? Do you go to a place and put your face in the phone, which you see, because that's a security blanket? Public transport's a good one. You see, I used to, I challenge myself. If I'm on public transport, I'll put my phone around and I'll look at people and have a look around mm. and see, I this too. You know, wait for somebody to make eye contact and then, you know, not a hello. You don't take public transit. I do it in lines. When I wait in a line, I try and consciously like just stand there and look at the people around me, see what's happening. Most of them are staring in their phone, but I'm the one person who if they did look up, they would catch their eye. Children are great yeah. for making eye contact and wanting to engage. And I love, you know, if you're at a playground or in a line and there's a little one and the I will engage because the freedom that a child has, the, the joy they just get in some amazing things, I'll go, I'm, I'm going to be a child right now. I'm going to engage and, and allow myself that moment. And it's sad because some people find children annoying. They need to be locked away and they're exhausting. Or, and it's like, that's sad. Oh, I could go on on so many different pathways <laughs> but I, I think I get where you're mm. going with this kind of like children are very this thing comes up a lot in this podcast like children are very free mm. you put children in a room together they will make friends you know a lot of adults come on here and want to talk about how we're modeling this for kids and it's like the beginning part the just like interacting kids are fine with that it is the choosing the intention and like almost it's like valuing connection and community so that they keep acting that way so that they keep initiating and talking and engaging and playing and throughout their life but somehow that gets like squashed at a certain age like it, it is there in all of us and somehow it gets ruined it gets ruined it gets challenged it gets shut down yeah. because it's not suitable right now that's not suitable behavior or any other made up rule that we have yeah it's like the comfort thing right like well it's more comfortable to stay in the box and follow the pattern and do what you are supposed to do but that has taken away the play and the childlike and the connection so is that really more comfortable? Because it's probably not. One in two adults are lonely. That's not comfortable. I say this thing all the time, like the shoulds of society are just as hard as getting rid of the shoulds. Like you're suffering by doing the should if it doesn't feel right to you. And you're equally dealing with the pushback from the people around you if you forego. Pick your hard. They're both hard. And I don't judge you for either one, but like your outcome, what is your outcome going to be with each one? Because they're both hard. One is not easier than the mm. other. It just feels easier because it's comfortable because it's what you have seen and learned to do. And staying in your cocoon of 
potential loneliness is more comfortable than maybe putting yourself out there. But I can say by putting yourself out there, you may have the opportunity to connect with another person that is in the same situation and it could be just a coffee Mm -hmm. at the coffee shop. Do you mind if I sit down with you? Do not have to have a massively engaged conversation. It could be literally sitting there reading the paper together, Mm -hmm. the paper. Who has the paper now? <laughs> it's like, you know, is it not online now? But, you know, people do. There will be, there'll be magazines in coffee shops. Yeah, that is, you know, making an intentional effort to make connections and be okay that they may not be that in-depth friendship. It might just be that little, hi, how are you, you know, and that might be all that's needed for yourself, for them, but you don't have to worry about that. It's just reaching out and being curious and childlike. Have you ever seen that when the, you know, well, for me, my kids when they were little would come running off the playground and go, I made a new best friend. I'm like, oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. What's their name? I don't know, but that's their dad over there. <laughs> Can you go and talk to him? okay, I would make the effort and go, hi, isn't it amazing how children can make connections so quickly? And it's just like, oh, and I had made friends with people in the playground because I recognised that the kids were doing it better than me. I learnt from them how to be okay with, would you play with me? Where do we lose that? When do we lose that ability to go up to somebody and say, can I sit at the table with you? Would you like to sit down and have a conversation? Do you want a game of chess? I saw you at 10 pin bowling. Would you like to have a game? It's just adult version of what the kids do. Hey, would you like to pop? got a ball. You want to come play with me? So maybe we could remember a little bit of our childhood and do something. Exactly. And hopefully listening to this episode, I think there are some very, very small doable examples in here of ways that you can lean into that. You can make these small connections. And hopefully now listening to this and the other episodes of this podcast, you can see that like long-term one, two of these a week could actually really impact your life. They don't need to be some big thing. They could impact somebody else's life. They could add up with other people also doing this and actually create a change in our lifetime. So don't get too overwhelmed by the, you know, big end goal of like reversing this or completely changing your life. Like just try and do a couple small things because they do add up over time. And I mean, I think that's it. I think we leave it there. This has been so great, Emery. We went narrow and broad and back again and I can't thank you enough for like being willing to go on that adventure with me today I appreciate it I love your podcast I it has helped me think and reflect and actually appreciate what I have but also what I could do for myself for my family Mm -hmm. and for my community thank you for this opportunity Mm -hmm. thank you for being here I'll be the first to admit that was a lot. If that was your first time ever listening to a Friendship IRL episode, uh, hi, hello, welcome. Not every episode is that intense, that's for sure. Some are much simpler. This one really took you on a journey. But I do think that it was a great kind of overview of how all these moving parts are impacting us. I would suggest, again, going back and listening to episode 38 and 39 about third places, episode 41 about the liking gap, because those are going to give you some background. I do want to thank Anne-Marie. This was such a beautiful conversation. and You might have heard in there, there there were some moments where I had some aha moments or saw something a little bit differently. You know, I literally was at a Toastmasters meeting the other night. And I had somebody at the meeting who was asking about my work and the podcast. And they said, so you talk about friendship. And I responded and I go, 
Yes, and I talk about community and structural issues and how all of this is interconnected and impacting our relationships. Because I think it's important, like if we don't acknowledge these little things, I can tell you, you know, go out there and talk to some acquaintances and it might be the reason you make your new best friend. But I just don't think that's fair for me to say that and then not acknowledge that that feels difficult. And it is for certain reasons. And we all need to be aware of those and the little ways that we can chip away at them. Thank you for coming on this journey with us today. I'm just really excited to hear your thoughts. So please, please don't be shy. Let me know where this led you. See you next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Friendship IRL. I am so honored to have these conversations with you, but don't let the chat die here. Send me a voice message. I created a special website just to chat with you. You can find it at alexalex.chat. You can also find me on Instagram. My handle at itsalexalexander or go ahead and leave a review wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. Now, if you want to take this conversation a step further, send this episode to a friend, tell them you found it interesting and use what we just talked about as a conversation starter the next time you and your friend hang out. No need for a teary goodbye. I'll be back with a new episode next week.